Cy Kellett. This is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy. How you doing, Cy? And we were all set to do it. Remember how Jimmy did that quiz uh, with me uh, one time on, on Jimmy's jobs? Is that what? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So which jobs had jobs you had and which had, had you not had? Right. And I was going to, I had this one for you, Jimmy, on my on my favorite books. Uh-huh. And some of these are my favorite books and some of these are not my favorite books, but we can't get uh-huh. I sent it in the wrong format oh. to uh, the well, video we can people. do it next time. So we can do it another time. Yeah. But um, let me ask you this. Any okay. books on there grab your attention? I'll just take it off uh, for the next time. I'll make a different list. Okay. So if there's a book there that grabs you that you want to talk about right now, we can do book discussion. It grabs me. Um, well, uh, I can, in terms of guessing which are, are among your favorites, um, I would guess, so, okay, so you've got the Silmarillion on here. Yeah. That's a possible. Yeah. Divine Comedy, that's a possible. Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein, that's a possible. No? <laughs> Don't like that one? Oh, I hate that book. Do you? Oh, my God. That was um, going to be one of my surprise ones. Cosmos by Carl Sagan. Yeah. I'm guessing that's uh, not probably one of your favorites. No. Um, Lost, Lost in the Cosmos by Walker Percy. I'm guessing that is one of your favorites. That's probably one of my all time. That goes in the, the top very I high. I know yeah. you're a Walker Percy fan. Yeah. Introduction to Christianity by Joseph Ratzinger. I'm guessing that is um, a favorite. Yes. Uh, Crossing the Threshold of Hope by John Paul II. I would guess that is... Brothers wait, Car- wait, hang on. Go, mm-hmm. Can we go back? Because yeah, okay. it's not. Oh, it's not? So I want to discuss okay. those two books. Okay, so we... let's talk about those. So Introduction to Christianity, or it really could have been this. Introduction to Christianity or Anything Else by Joseph Ratzinger mm-hmm. is on my favorites list. I, I can't think, I mean, uh, Spirit really, of the Liturgy. really good. Uh, yeah, all the Jesus uh, books, you know, mm-hmm. the Jesus of uh, Nazareth books that he wrote, all really good. And then... Crossing the Threshold of Hope, I'm not a huge fan of. Uh-huh. And I wonder Any particular if... reason? I find that uh, Pope John Paul II has a tendency to be, um, like, go around and around yeah, and around like this. Yeah, he has like an this. elliptical writing style. And it does not work for me. Oh. And people will say, oh, what a beautiful writer he is. And I have never, like, I, I read his Roman triptych, that mm-hmm. poem. I, I'm not good at reading poetry, though, so mm-hmm. it may be just great, but it didn't grab me. And I read his uh, books, and they do not have an effect like um, mm-hmm. like uh, Ratzinger or Benedict yeah. uh, had. Well, you know, John Paul II had a reputation for having a, a rather difficult writing style. Um, Did he? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, no, okay. that was widely acknowledged. Um, and Joseph Ratzinger is very clear mm-hmm. in term by comparison in terms of how he writes, except when he's being studiedly ambiguous which sometimes he would, you know, in order to avoid, avoid coming yeah. down on a particular question. He didn't want right. to come down on a certain way. Um, I, I, I enjoyed Crossing the Threshold of Hope um, it, it because it was a more, for people who may not be familiar with this book, it was one that uh, an Italian journalist had submitted a list of uh, questions yeah. to John Paul II, and, um, and he didn't have time to answer them at the time. But just on his own, in minutes here and there, apparently, he hand-wrote out answers to the questions yeah. and and then surprised the, the journalist by giving him this manuscript all completed. Right. And it's not a uh, document of the magisterium. It's, it's effectively a papal interview. Yeah. And I found it, as an interview, I found it interesting. Uh, the Pope um, was re- candid on some things uh, that... Uh, he likely wouldn't have been quite as candid on if, oh, in, that's in a magisterial yeah. document. Right. Um, he even got in a little bit of trouble. I mean, he described Buddhism in some rather unflattering terms. Um, he also uh, s- came really close. Now, it's obvious in hindsight, uh, but he came really, really close to revealing the third secret of Fatima in, in oh. Crossing the Threshold of Hope. He basically does. It's just he's but not... But you couldn't tell it. Because... You, you couldn't quite tell it, but then in hindsight, it's like, yep, that's exactly what he's saying. I didn't remember that. Oh, yeah. okay. So I, I enjoyed that one. And, uh, mm-hmm. okay, okay, but... Um... All right, but let me ask you this from your insider perspective, because I know you know the inside story on everything in the uh, Catholic Church. Everyone calls no. you up and says, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy, this is Pope Francis. Here's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but how much of uh, John Paul's... Uh, writing, whether it's encyclicals or uh, exhortations or Mm -hmm. whatever, do you think was done by Cardinal Ratzinger? It's hard to say. Um, I don't think that the—it's certainly not the case the majority was. Uh Um, The the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith itself was a full-time job, and so Ratzinger 
when he was the head of the CDF during John Paul II's reign, um, he he already had a lot to do. Yeah. And now they would be called in to consult when an encyclical was in preparation because they'd review it and so forth. Um, and the rumor is that um, John Paul II's encyclical Fides et Ratio on philosophy um, was written by uh, was ghostwritten by. Uh, Reno Fisichella and Joseph Ratzinger. Oh. And some people have even joked that instead of uh, Fides et Ratio, it should be called Fisichella et Ratzinger. <laughs> That's um, funny. <laughs> but, uh, but it's clear that, it, it, but that it, different, different classes of his writing were written by different people, and you can tell that. Um, many of his encyclicals were written by him, and yeah. it's clear because they have that distinctive elliptical round writing around, style. Around yeah. Um, also, uh, you know, uh, like his theology of the body, uh, or his oh, love, the, love and responsibility lectures. Turns were, out to be, oh, love and responsibility yeah. lectures. Yes, right, um, I see. But then his, his Wednesday audiences were clearly ghostwritten. Um, I don't know by who. Now, ultimately, he takes responsibility for them, so they're his. You know, I mean, yeah. he delivered them. And that's been true for popes for centuries. Yeah, they I don't, mean, you don't write everything that no. comes out under your name. No. Um, but a, a, a lot of his encyclicals were personal things that he wrote mm -hmm. um, that others then reviewed, but then uh, others seem to have been written by a combination of different people. Uh, frankly, the the writings of his that I enjoy the most are his Wednesday audiences. Uh, the reason for that being because he, you know, he reigned for 25 years and he gave uh, a, a Wednesday audience almost every week, and he used most of them for catechetical purposes. Yeah. Um, they he gets to hit all kinds of different topics that a pope would normally not address. In a uh, in in like an encyclical or something, and so even though they have a lower level of authority than an encyclical, they have this wide topical range. Yeah, right. And so one of the first things I do when I'm researching um, what the church says on a subject, especially if it's an obscure subject or more obscure subject that, that's one that may not be mentioned in the catechism, for example, is I'll go to the audiences of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, oh. and I'll search them electronically looking for, you know, the subject I'm interested yeah. in. Yeah. Um, just the other day, just yesterday, in fact, I'm working on a talk I'm going to give this weekend on uh, miracles, um, re private revelations, and supernatural gifts. And so I wanted to see what John Paul II had said about miracles to see if he had like more depth on the subject than than what you get in the catechism because the catechism like doesn't yeah. go into a lot of depth on the subject. Um, and so I I immediately went and found a whole range of of talks from 1987 where in his Wednesday audiences John Paul II was talking about the miracles of Christ and in 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 some depth. Oh yeah, did you? Enjoy the audiences that Pope Benedict gave on the Church Fathers. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah, this? We, very much. Did, did you? Yeah, because you had written already extensively about the Church Fathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and on various uh, biblical figures as well. He did, and uh -huh. also on doctors of the Church. So I really, I really loved all those. I, I um, the the audiences of both John Paul II and Benedict the, Benedict the Sixteenth have just a lot of real fascinating stuff in them. Um, and uh, did you did you like he would give his take on various church fathers? Mm -hmm. Did you disagree yeah. with any of them? Did you go oh I, or I never not disagree but say oh that's not how I looked at it or I didn't see it that way? Oh well, you know I, I occasionally would find things where I might have a different point of view, but um, not necessarily on on particular church fathers. I'd tend to defer to his expertise there. Uh, okay, uh, next time we'll do the quiz on size favorite books. See if Jimmy can pick out which ones are my favorites and which ones aren't, and why easy, Shel Silverstein easy is to not. Stump me. <laughs> okay, all right. We'll be, we have to take a little silence, and then we start uh, Open Forum on Catholic Answers Live right after this.
Welcome to Catholic Answers Live, the program where you participate with your questions about apologetics and evangelization, including the most important theological, spiritual, moral, and social issues facing the world today. Call now with your question for today's guest. Toll free, 1-888-31-TRUTH. That's 888-318-7884. Now, from San Diego, Catholic Answers Live. It's Tuesday. That's Open Forum. Open Forum today on Catholic Answers Live, 888-318-7884. Our number, 888-31-TRUTH. I am Cy Kelly, your host, and Open Forum means really anything that you would like to know about the Catholic Church. We would like to help you get the answer that you're looking for. Uh, whether you would like to, uh, maybe there's something that you feel you disagree with about the Catholic Church, or something that you maybe just don't understand, don't grasp, maybe you need an answer for a child or a parent or someone in your life about something that you're not ex exactly quite sure how to answer that. That's what Open Forum is for. Uh, anybody's welcome to call. You don't have to be Catholic to call. 888 318 Seven eight eight four. Our guest this hour. Since it's Tuesday, that means it's Tim Staples Day, right? I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say. Yeah, Tim's going to. I'm really. He's going to be on fire today. I'm pretty uh -huh. sure of it. Yeah, because you know how. Uh, that's Jimmy Aiken, senior apologist here at Catholic Answers. Hi, Jimmy. Hey, how you doing, Cy? I actually hate to let you down about this, but the reason that you're here mm -hmm. oh, yeah. is that Tim's not coming. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Aww. I know. We tricked you into coming, thinking that Tim was going to be here, oh, but no. you're actually covering for him. What? <laughs> yeah, you're covering for him. Did so. we agree to this? I, <laughs> I don't know. I but understood you're on the there air was now. to be no math. <laughs> no, yeah. I, there will be no math while I am on the air. That's that's the case. Jimmy Aiken is, uh, in addition to being senior apologist here at Catholic Answers, is also the author of A Daily Defense: 365 Days Plus One to Become a Better Apologist. Jimmy, I like to start these open forums with you by randomly selecting a question from. Um, a daily defense, 365 okay. days, plus one to becoming a better apologist. And I landed on day 107, the Word of God. Here is the challenge. And the, the way this works is, Jimmy, each page, Jimmy gives you a challenge to the Catholic faith, and then he gives the defense of the Catholic position, uh, and it's done before the end of the page, or by the end of the page, so it's succinct. Uh, here's the challenge, Jimmy. Catholicism is false because it bases its teachings on things other than the Bible, the Word of God. Well, okay. Um, the there's an, there are a couple of assumptions there. The first thing is that the Catholic Church bases its teachings on things other than the Word of God. No, uh, the in, anything that's church teaching is something that the Catholic Church is getting from the Word of God. It's not getting its teachings from science. It's not getting its teachings from biography, it's not getting its teachings from, you know, art theory or anything like that. Um, those may all be interesting disciplines uh, worthy of study in and of themselves, but they're not church teaching. Um, the, in, in order for the church to teach something in the proper sense, it has to be coming from the Word of God. And that's, so that's the first problematic assumption. The second problematic assumption in the challenge is that the Word of God is to be identified with the Bible. The Bible is an expression of the Word of God, but it is not the only expression of the Word of God. There are multiple other expressions of the Word of God as well. Um, to cite a famous example, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is himself the Word of God according to the first chapter of John. Now, that's something that many people who make this objection will be prepared to acknowledge. They'll say, okay, well, okay, Jesus is the Word of God incarnate, but the Bible is the Word of God written. Okay, well, it's true, the Bible is the Word of God, and it is written, but that, again, doesn't restrict the Word of God to just those two categories of the Word of God uh, in the person of Christ incarnate and the Word of God in inspired Scripture. The, God's Word can also be conveyed in other ways. Um, we see this, for example, in not in John 1, but in Genesis 1, where by His Word God creates. Uh, the entire world, and we see in other passages God bringing about effects in the world by His Word. Um, you know, very, he'll, he'll accomplish various effects in nature, for example, later on in the Bible by means of His Word. And so God's creative Word 
is something in addition to the incarnate word and the inspired written word. Also, when you actually study the way the concept of God's word appears in Scripture, you find that the apostles recognize the Christian faith as the word of God. It'll talk about they'll talk about uh, you know preaching the word to people in terms of the Christian faith, even though none of the books of the New Testament were yet written. And so that indicates that there's an oral proclamation of the Christian message that at that point uh, was being handed on by tradition, not in scripturated form, but orally. And so there is an oral Word of God as well. And uh, the Catholic Church would say, when we base our teachings on the Word of God, we need to take into account all of the different manifestations of God's Word and not artificially truncate that to simply what we find in his inspired written Word or his inspired written Word and the Incarnate Son, which we know about through the inspired written Word. We want to take into account all of the different ways God has communicated with us, and that's the basis of our teaching. Well, thanks for that, Jimmy. Um, the, uh, we have a bunch of calls coming up. Uh, I know the lines fill up quickly on uh, open forum days. 888-318-7884 is the number. Before, I, I would like to go to a call, but before we go to the break, Jimmy, and then we'll come back and, and start dealing with these calls, I did want to ask you about something that happened today oh, yeah. in, the, in yeah. the church. So a little bit of news, and, and it's always good to clarify those things. Mm-hmm. The, uh, Pope Francis uh, issued a motto proprio, a, mm-hmm. um, a, a, a work by his own authority. On his own initiative. On his own initiative. Mm-hmm. And in that, he changed... Uh, part of the uh, method or the mode or the, mm-hmm. that by which someone might become a saint. Right. So yeah. how, what happened? So basically, um, up to now, there have been kind of two paths for uh, sainthood. One is living a life of heroic virtue, and the other is martyrdom. And so if you, if you were a martyr and you, uh, you know, gave your life uh, for the faith, you could be beatified and eventually become a saint, or if you lived a life of really beyond normal, I mean, heroic virtue, the same thing could happen. But um, Pope Francis has now added another category, which actually is kind of based on some things that had already been in motion previously. Uh, If you look back, for example, into the reign of John Paul II, there were some cases where people would be, for example, canonized as if they were martyrs, even though they didn't really fit the traditional definition of martyrdom. Examples would be Maximilian Kolbe or Mm -hmm. uh, Maria Goretti. Um, they were they were both they've both been described as martyrs, but when you look at their cases, it's not really traditional martyrdom. And so Benedict the Sixteenth, when he became pope, um, indicated that the Congregation for the Causes of Saints needed to be uh, stricter about how it was using the term martyr. Because and and so he pointed out, you know, a martyr is someone who voluntarily accepts death because of hatred of the faith. So mm-hmm. you have to, it has to be voluntary. You can't, it, you can't just be nailed because someone hates Christianity and, you know, shoots you from across the street randomly. That doesn't make you a martyr. Mm-hmm. You need to, you need, someone needs to say something like, okay, are you a Christian? Yeah. Are you willing to cease being a Christian? No. Okay. We're going to kill you. And mm-hmm. then they do. That's classic martyrdom. That's the way people were martyred in the early church. But, um, it, it doesn't fit some of the recent examples, like Maximilian Kolbe. Uh, he died in a concentration camp where he voluntarily offered his life in place of another man. But so that's not... That's not he's not being killed directly because someone hates Christianity. It's this other guy was going to get killed, and he voluntarily stepped into the other man's place. Like with Maria Goretti, um, she, was, uh, she was raped and murdered, and she, you know, told her attacker that he should not do this because the rape, because it would displease God. Um, but he didn't hate Christianity and kill her because he hated Christianity. Right. So it doesn't really fit the traditional martyrdom paradigm. And so there has been some discussion for a number of years of is there another way, because these people clearly displayed 
uh, virtue in an extraordinary way, yeah. but it, it wasn't necessarily their entire life. It's not like they lived an entire life of in a monastery doing penance or and things like that. Um, so uh, they, like in Maria Goretti's case, her extraordinary virtue was manifest right at the end. Yeah. And so what Pope Francis has done is uh, create a new category where in addition to having a path to sainthood via martyrdom or um, or heroic virtue, one can also, in terms of the motu proprio, offer one's life. And so this could fit, for example, potentially cases like Maximilian Kolbe or St. Saint, uh, Saint Mala, who, yeah. who was willing to risk her own life in order to save the life of her unborn baby. Yeah. And um, so this kind of potentially can clarify some of the situations that don't really fit the historic categories, but where there is, you know, something really admirable and holy that the Church wants to honor and hold up as an example of saintly behavior, even though it doesn't fit the categories previously in use. So um, uh, we can look forward to what hearing, from this hearing, now? Well, the, 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 what's the idea? So that we—it's because these people did become saints, but it's a clarification of the purpose so that we— yeah, now what application this may have to, to people who've already been declared saints is unclear. They may just leave them as kind of grandfathered in the existing yeah. categories. But going forward, um, it will now be possible for dioceses to, to say, okay, well, this person offered their life in a, for the love of God and in a virtuous way, um, and we want to open a cause for their canonization on those grounds. Mm -hmm. Instead of having to prove they either were martyred in the traditional sense or that they right. had lived an entire life of heroic virtue. I, I, we do have to go to a break, but I, I'm just thinking about the chaplain um, from the Korean War who gave his life because he wouldn't leave the troops and he was continuing to minister to people. Yeah. Under. So that would kind of fall into this category. Yeah, he, and, and anyone whose cause is presently open might, you know, yeah. they might, be, might be reconfigured in a way to take into account this new legislation. Open Forum today on Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken, our guest, our number, 888-318-7884. We'll be right back with more Catholic Answers right after this. We're here for you. Give us a call today on Catholic Answers Live. Howdy folks, this is Jimmy Aiken, and I'm here to tell you about a very special promotion we look forward to every year. It's our annual store-wide summer sale in the online shop at catholic.com. This online event features savings from 10 to 50% and more in some cases on every book, track, CD, DVD, ebook, and MP3 we carry, including my newest book, A Daily Defense. With lower prices and a great selection of solid Catholic resources, it's a sale you can't afford to miss. So log on now and all this month, at shop.catholic.com and take advantage of our very special prices. You know it's all good stuff because it's from the people you know and trust at Catholic Answers. That's shop.catholic.com. Do you love praying for people? Have you ever wanted to use your gift of prayer to share Jesus with others and build up the body of Christ? Start a public prayer station with St. Paul Street Evangelization. Listen to people's needs, pray with them, or invite them to meet you at church. St. Paul Street Evangelization can help you get started. Find out how at streetevangelization.com. That's streetevangelization.com. The Catholic Answers Minute. I'm Father Vincent Serpent. In Matthew 10, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority to drive out unclean spirits and to cure every disease. He then sent them out after instructing them to avoid pagan territory and Samaritan towns. They were to proclaim the kingdom of heaven to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His first concern was for his chosen people. God had singled them out for a special relationship with him. Jesus, the Messiah, who came from them and for them, was simply acknowledging this. God would never forget his special relationship with them. Even now they remain his chosen people. But his love is not limited to them. His love is not limited, period. You are the deliberate result of his love. Not only is every hair of your head numbered, so is every beat of your heart. In life and death, you are his. I'm Father Vincent Serpa for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. Call now with your question, 888-318-7884. 
This is Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back. Two hours of open forum today on Catholic Answers Live. Any questions you have about the Catholic Church, the Catholic faith, we're happy to take, and you don't have to be Catholic to call. You can be anything. You can be Catholic. You can be non-Catholic. You can be anti-Catholic, whatever. We'll take those calls, 888-318-7884. We start with Morrow in Pembroke Pines, Florida, listening on the Catholic Answers app. Morrow, your question for Jimmy Aiken. Yes. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you guys doing? Just fine. Great. Uh, by the way, Jimmy, I have your book, uh, Daily Defense. I really like it. I've been reading it every day, so thanks for that work. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. So my question is on the Immaculate Conception. Um, my girlfriend and I, um, she's a Protestant, I am not. We have opened up dialogue, and um, we are attempting to uh, work this out, you know, one step at a time. And one thing that she um, is, I guess, very uh, stagnant on is, you know, is kind of like her, she has a respect for Mary, but not any kind of devotion, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so basically, she says that the Immaculate Conception, the teaching is false, it's made up, I know it's not, I know that dogmas don't have to get, you know, official until they're contested in the church. So what I wanted to ask you was, could you provide me with some early church resources for the Immaculate Conception of Mary, if there's any early Christian documents or anything that anyone said okay. um, about her? Sure. Um, now, one of the things that you have to be a little careful with in terms of the Immaculate Conception is uh, the terminology that's involved, because uh, when we say that Mary was conceived immaculately, uh, the term immaculate refers to um, being conceived in a way that she was free from all stain of original sin. That's where, what the word means in, its, in terms of its roots. In Latin, macula means stain, and so to be born immaculate means without the stain of original sin. And that means that we uh, won't expect to find uh, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception articulated in an explicit way using that terminology until after such time as the doctrine of original sin has been articulated using the standard modern terminology of original sin. And so even though the doctrine of original sin, the intrinsic fallenness of human nature in the present age, is something that is clearly taught in Scripture, that vocabulary for describing it hadn't yet developed in the Church. It took a few centuries, just like the word uh, Trinity. Uh, isn't used in the Bible. The doctrine of the Trinity is in the Bible, but uh, it took a while for that vocabulary to develop. And even the word Bible didn't originally uh, come into being until some centuries after Scripture was already completed. So, um, So we wouldn't expect to find people in the early centuries saying things like, Mary was immaculately conceived, but they do say things that point in that direction. An example uh, has to do with the curse that Eve is given in Genesis 3, where after the fall uh, she is told, so now she has incurred original sin in the most proper sense she and Adam have, um, and it's going to be passed on to their descendants, and, and God tells Eve, I will multiply your pains in childbearing. And so this greater degree of pain in childbearing has been understood uh, all the way down through Jewish and Christian history as being one of the consequences of our fallen state. It's one of the consequences of original sin. So then when you find people in the early church talking about how Mary gave birth without any pain, that would suggest Mary is not under the curse of original sin. She's not being affected by the stain of original sin the way ordinary women are. And we indeed find uh, this taught very clearly very early in, script- in early Christian doctrines, uh, documents. For example, there is a document called The Ascension of Isaiah, and uh, it's a kind of prophetic text. It's, a, it's an example of an early Christian apocalypse. Um, and scholars, you know, 
vary somewhat on when they date it. Some would put it in the early second century. Some would put it in the second half of the first century. Uh, recently, I did a detailed study of the dating of the Ascension of Isaiah, and I concluded that it looks like it was written in A.D. 67. Uh, you can actually date it rather precisely based on the clues in the text. And uh, I, I, t it looks like it's actually even a little bit older than the book of Revelation, uh, which I would put in the year A.D. 70 or 69 or 70. Uh, so this is a very early Christian document, and according to the Ascension of Isaiah, Mary uh, gave birth to Jesus without any pain. And this is not the only early Christian document that does that. There's another early Christian document known as the Odes of Solomon that d says the same thing. And so we have these traditions about Mary in circulation right there in the first and second century within just decades of the event, uh, indicating that she seems to have been free from the consequences of original sin that other women are subject to. And so even though the vocabulary for talking about the Immaculate Conception hadn't arisen yet, uh, this is something that's already being discussed in other terms right there in the first and second century. If you'd like to read more about that, I'd suggest uh, taking a look at a copy of my book, The Fathers Know Best. I have uh, a chapter devoted to things that the early church fathers said about Mary and what made her distinctive, and that could be of assistance as well. Thanks very much, Mauro. Lots of calls, so I'm going to keep moving. Uh, Mickey in Livonia, Michigan. Uh, your question for Jimmy Aiken. Hello, Jimmy and Cy. Hi. That's my question. Hi. Uh, can a person be a heretic and then elected to the papacy, and then as a result of their personal heretical stance, really not be the pope, even though they were validly elected? I'm asking this question in the context of Dr. Kelly Bowering's teachings. Okay. Um, well, I would have to say, and this is something that, uh, given the fact that we have a hard break coming up, I can't really go into a great deal of detail about um, at the moment, but I would say that uh, the, whether what private opinions a person may have has no bearing canonically on their election as pope. Um, there have been uh, theologians in the church who have questioned what would happen if, after being elected pope, a, uh, a, an individual were to publicly proclaim manifest heresy, uh, but that's a separate question than the one you're asking. Simply the fact that uh, an individual might harbor uh, erroneous theological views on a matter that would be materially heretical would not of itself prevent someone from being validly elected pope. The question would be what would happen thereafter if he chose to publicly proclaim this, and that's something on which there is a diversity of opinion. In terms of uh, Kelly Bowering, I'm afraid I can't uh, recommend uh, the writings of that individual, and it's, I've, I've done some research into that area, but unfortunately I don't have time to go into that right now, so I would urge caution. Uh, thank you very much for that call. Uh, we've got uh, just about an hour and a half left of open forum, so if you have not called, give a dial the phone, 888-318-7884, 888-318-7884, a, th a, a special hello to all you watching on Facebook, uh, YouTube Live, and Periscope. Uh, Jimmy, I, I want, one of the questions that came up on um, uh, YouTube, excuse me, Facebook, what had to do with what's the earliest evidence we have for purgatory? Mm -hmm. What's... Well, um, we have some evidence in Second Maccabees, uh, which is a document that was written in the, um, in the second or first century BC, where we have an indication that already at that time, people who were in the Jewish faith and who believed in the afterlife were doing things in order to help those who had fallen asleep in righteousness, but nevertheless had some consequences of sin that uh, they needed to have dealt with. Uh, we see an example of that with Judah Maccabee offering uh, prayer and offering uh, sacrifice at the temple for some soldiers who had fallen in battle. We see the theme of purification after death of the consequences of sin continuing in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 3. 
see, and we see it unfolding also in the writings of the Church Fathers, uh, as also documented in The Fathers Know Best. So not a medieval invention? Nope. We'll be right back with more Open Forum right after this on Catholic Answers Live. Hang on, we'll be right back with more Catholic Answers Live. Father Larry Richards. You know, I'm from the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and both of my parents, both of them, were police officers. My father was a police officer, and my mother was a police officer. They always thought I'd be a cop, too, and in some ways I am, a spiritual cop. But we keep doing what we do, and we come from wherever we come from, it doesn't matter. Where God is calling us is what's most important. Open Line with Father Larry Richards, Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. As legend tells it, 500 years ago, a disaffected Augustinian priest nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. The evidence that he actually did this is pretty thin, but Martin Luther's objections to Catholic teachings concerning purgatory and indulgences set off a series of countless ruptures that the church suffers to this very day. The faithful Catholic wants to be God's instrument in healing these ruptures, but may not know where to begin. Join us this September 28th to 30th as we tackle the topic at Catholic Answers 4th National Apologetics Conference, The Reunion of All Christians, a lively and inspiring conference designed to ignite and inform your faith. We've got an all-star lineup of speakers guaranteed to fire you up. Catholic historian Steve Weidenkopf, apologist Mark Brumley, apologist Devin Rose, plus all of your favorite Catholic Answers apologists. This is an event you don't want to miss. This is where it all begins. Join us this September for a conference that is sure to leave you wanting more. Seats are still available, but they're going fast. Visit CatholicAnswersConference.com or call 1-888-291-8000 today to register. That's CatholicAnswersConference.com. Our Catholic Answers Summer Series continues tonight. Uh, live in the San Diego area, you can uh, go see and hear Christopher Check, our president, speaking on from Hernan Cortez to Our Lady of Guadalupe, the earliest years of the European entry into Mexico. Uh, the talk will be at Ascension Catholic Church, 7 p.m. tonight, and if you're not in the San Diego area, it's perfectly okay because, well, it's, it's okay because you chose to live somewhere else, but we also live stream the talk for you. So if you want to get more information on the live streaming, just go to the Catholic Answers Facebook page. Just open up Facebook and type in Catholic Answers, and you will get there. Open forum here today on Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken, our guest. Uh, Jimmy, we are full of calls. How about we go back to them? Okay. Uh, Mark in Elkhart, Indiana, listening on Redeemer Radio. Mark, your question for Jimmy Aiken. Hello, gentlemen. First of all, uh, thank you very much. I really enjoy your program each day. So Thank you. My question has to do with, from an apologetic standpoint, how would you explain that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, seems to be really alive and even gifts of the Spirit seem to be present in many Protestant churches? And I ask this specifically in the context of St. Paul in chapter 11 of Acts of the Apostles, seems to use, when he's preaching to the Gentiles, he seems to use as a defense to the other apostles that the reason that this is valid, that the Gentiles should be part of their ministry is that when he speaks to them, the Holy Spirit is present with them. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could um, discuss that. Sure. So the incident you're referring to uh, really starts in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, where St. Peter is directed to go to the household of Cornelius and to preach the Word of God to him. And when he does, there are manifestations of the Holy Spirit that then convince Peter that um, the Gentiles are acceptable to God and should be baptized without delay, and that they don't need to be circumcised and become Jews in order to be Christians. And he then goes, uh, when he goes back to Jerusalem, he's questioned about this, because not everybody in the Jerusalem community held this view, and uh, a lot of them thought that, well, you need to be a Jew in order to become a Christian, and so why did you baptize these people? And he then, as you indicate, does point out 
that uh, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like he did on us, and because of these manifestations, it clearly indicated that they were acceptable to God, just as they were, no circumcision, no circumcision necessary, and so that's why he baptized them. And uh, people found that argument persuasive and concluded, well, God has therefore granted repentance unto life, even to the Gentiles. So in, what does that uh, let us infer about the Holy Spirit and his activity outside of the Catholic Church today? Well, it certainly shows us that it's possible for the Holy Spirit to be active in the lives of people, even though they're not formal members of the Catholic Church. Uh, God is omnipotent, and so he can do what he chooses. And the example here shows us that Indeed, he sometimes, it, certainly on this occasion, chose to operate outside of the visible boundaries of the church, including, uh, in this case, among people who weren't even yet baptized, whereas, you know, our Protestant friends typically are baptized. So the Holy Spirit can do that. Now, there's a rule of biblical interpretation that n needs to be borne in mind, uh, which is that you don't want to appeal to exceptional cases to determine what ordinarily happens. And so there can be a temptation to look at things that happen in Scripture that are kind of unusual and say, well, just because God can do this, that means this is his ordinary will. This is his will for what should ordinarily happen. And it would be a mistake to look at this passage and say, oh, well, therefore, it doesn't matter whether you're baptized, or it doesn't matter what church you belong to, since God can operate in your life by the Holy Spirit without those things. Well, that would be to misread the text. I mean, that would be, because this clearly is an exceptional circumstance. This is not something that ordinarily happened. If it did ordinarily happen, then it already would have been settled that uh, Gentiles could be accepted in the church without being circumcised first. So this is something God is doing in order to make a point to St. Peter and to the rest of the early church. He's teaching a special lesson here that had not been proclaimed earlier. And in fact, before Peter even went to the household of Cornelius, God gave him a vision to set him up for the encounter. So this is clearly an instance that is not normal. God's making a special exception in order to teach a lesson in this case, and therefore we need to be cautious in what lessons we draw from it. We can draw the conclusion that God uh, can and does sometimes work outside the boundaries of the visible church with the Holy Spirit, but we can't conclude from that that the visible church is unimportant or that it doesn't matter to God whether you're baptized or whether you're part of the Catholic Church. Those would be invalid inferences from this. Also, there's another disanalogy here, and I kind of alluded to it already, which is the fact that um, our Protestant brothers and sisters are already baptized. They're, that's why they're brothers and sisters in Christ, is because they are already Christians. So the difference in Acts 10 and 11 is between people who aren't yet Christian and people who are, whereas the difference uh, between uh, the situation in Protestant churches and the Catholic Church is between a group of Christians who are in partial communion with the church that Jesus established, because they have baptism, they have the basics of the Christian faith and so forth, even though they don't have the fullness of it. And then in the Catholic Church, the situation of having the fullness of the faith and the means of grace that Jesus wanted us to have. So our Protestant friends are already in partial communion with Christ's church, and that would give us even more reason to uh, suppose the Holy Spirit is working in their lives in many instances, because he obviously is working in baptism, and they have valid baptism, and so there's an example right there of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. How's that strike you, Mark? That's great. Um, I think I could use that to explain some of the commonalities and sort of the differences, talking about that we share in baptism and so forth. So great. That helps a lot. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. We go now to Daniel in San Francisco, California, listening on Immaculate Heart Radio. Daniel, you are on with Jimmy Aiken. What's your question? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity, and it's it's a great show, and I really appreciate you taking my call. Uh, it's it's a little bit of a question, uh, more of a wondering also into like, 
when we, if we go to heaven, uh, hopefully we all do, is, is what are we supposed to do? I, I, I believe that there has to be some duties or something like that that we have to do. Mm-hmm. You think about it, uh, probably God is very busy, Jesus is very busy. We cannot just be sitting around. So what are we supposed to do? Well, it, not a lot has been revealed to us about this. Um, scripture, on the one hand, depicts the afterlife as a time of rest, um, where the saints rest from their labors in this life. So uh, w- to some extent, we may be resting. On the other hand, Scripture also depicts uh, the saints in heaven doing other things. It, it talks about, if you look in the book of Revelation, for example, it shows the saints in heaven worshiping God. And so worship will be part of our experience in the afterlife, just like it is here on earth. Also, uh, we know that the saints in heaven intercede or pray for the saints on earth. We see them doing that in heaven, and so that's something that we'll be doing in the afterlife. And then we also have passages, for example, in St. Paul talking about how we're going to reign with Christ and how on presumably on the last day we're going to judge angels. And so there presumably will be some reigning uh, and judging functions that go on at different points in the afterlife, but precisely how that all plays out and whether we'll have things that correspond to occupations like we have them here on earth, where we have a kind of division of labor among different people where we do different tasks, like Sai is serving as host, I'm serving as guest at the moment on this radio show. Whether we'll continue to have those kind of divisions of labor in heaven is something that we'll just have to wait and see on because heaven fundamentally transcends or goes beyond what we can imagine right now, and we'll have to leave a lot of that in God's hands. What do you think, Daniel? Oh, no, very good. Uh, All is very good answers. Thank you very much. Okay, thank Thank you very much for calling. Call any time, Daniel. Uh, We go now to Kathy in Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Maria Radio. Kathy, your question for Jimmy Aiken. Hello. Um, my question is that I'm looking for an understanding of the different definitions of grace mm-hmm. in Catholic theology. Okay. Um, according to the Catechism in paragraphs like 2010 and 2027, it looks like we're able to merit uh, the increase or decrease in grace according to our works of charity, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also says that we cannot merit the initial grace of conversion. Mm-hmm. So... My question is, is in light of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, are grace and works mutually exclusive? And if not, where in Scripture does it show these different types of grace? Um, okay. Because it's looking like there's different types of grace. Yeah. There are different types of grace, and that's something that's reflected even in Scripture. Um, the Scripture, though, doesn't have a developed taxonomy or list of the different types of grace. Uh, That's something that scholars in their reflection on Scripture have discerned. It's like, okay, in this passage the term is being used differently than in these other passages. And over the course of uh, the history of theology, theologians have developed a kind of technical vocabulary for referring to different types of grace, and we need to be a little careful when we are uh, talking about uh, the different types of grace, because they don't, there can be a kind of risk of anachronism or reading back of terminology that developed in a later age onto the texts of the Bible, because when the Bible was written, they didn't have a developed list of here are the different types of grace. And so they used the word grace in the New Testament in a kind of fluid and flexible way that could refer to multiple different types of grace and that could be used differently on different occasions, and they didn't have labels for the different types of grace. So it, it, it tends to be a much more flexible and fluid way of discussing the subject. In terms of later theology, the basic... Um, the most fundamental distinction in different types of grace that you ordinarily encounter is between what's known as um, as sanctifying grace and actual grace. Actual grace consists of the basically the nudges that God gives you to do good things. So like the grace of conversion, 
for example, it would be based on actual grace. If God is nudging you towards conversion, that's actual grace he's giving you. When you then convert and he makes you holy and justifies you and sanctifies you, um, you then have what's known as sanctifying grace, which is referred to as a habitual grace because it's something that remains in your soul. It's not just a temporary nudge that he gives you. It's something that stays with you, that changes the character of your soul. And um, so uh, when you're reading in the Catechism and it talks about how we're not able to merit the initial grace of conversion, that's quite true, because we, prior to conversion, we don't have the virtue of charity or the supernatural love of God in our souls yet. That's a supernatural gift that God gives us when we convert. He makes us capable of supernatural love, of loving him and loving his creatures for his own sake. Um, So once we then have the uh, grace of conversion, God gives us the virtue of charity or supernatural love that enables us to do actions of supernatural love, which are what uh, St. Paul refers to as good works, and then as a result of doing these acts of charity or acts of love, we do grow in holiness, and thus we can acquire or be given more sanctifying grace. And that's what the Catechism means when it talks about we can merit an increase of grace. It means that we can do actions under the influence of God's grace that will cause us to then grow in sanctifying grace. That's what it's talking about. And so faith and good works aren't mutually exclusive, either on the basis of uh, of Ephesians or any other book of the Bible. Um, the Catholic Church and Scripture are in agreement that we need God's grace in order to be able to come to God and be forgiven and be justified, and then the good works that we do are something that grow from that justification and from that grace that God gives us when we convert. So if you'd like to read more about that, I'd suggest my book, The Salvation Controversy, where I have the chance to go into this in a lot more detail. We have to take a break, however, Kathy, so we'll thank you for your call, and we'll be right back with more Open Forum with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live right after this. Catholic Answers Live with Jimmy Aiken is coming right back. Hi, this is Trent Horn, and I'm here to tell you about a very special promotion we look forward to every year, our annual store-wide summer sale in the online shop at Catholic.com. This online event includes savings of 10 to 50 percent, and more in some cases on every book, track, CD, DVD, ebook, and MP3 we carry, including my new book, Why We're Catholic. With lower prices and a great selection, it's by far the best online Catholic sale of the summer. So log on now and all this month to the shop at shop.catholic.com and take advantage of our very special prices. These materials will build up your faith because they're from the people you know and trust at Catholic Answers. Christian men, beware. With the idols of materialism, entertainment, and the flesh, it's plain to see that the world wants you for its own. Face it, it's tempting and easy to be a man of the world. Father Terrence Ehrman has a challenge for you. Be a man of God instead. In his new book, Man of God lessons to young men about life, sex, friendship, vocation, and loving with the heart of Christ. Father Ehrman draws on his experiences counseling men who are struggling to live in the world but not be of the world. In a unique format, he offers a plan for ongoing conversion, holy spiritual direction for all men who want to master it themselves and be transformed from within. Order your copy of Man of God today by calling one 291 8000 visiting the shop at catholic.com, or asking for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Catholic Answers Live is brought to you in part by CatholicSingles.com, the website for Catholics who want to meet others who share their Catholic values for faith, fellowship, and love. You can learn more at CatholicSingles.com. Catholic Answers Live thanks CatholicSingles.com for their generous support. Homeschool Connections has recently formed a partnership featuring a dual enrollment program with Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our website is homeschoolconnections.com. We are a proud sponsor of Catholic Answers Live. Call now with your question, 888-318-7884. 
This is Catholic Answers Live. Open forum today on Catholic Answers Live. Two whole hours. Next hour, Tom Nash will be in here uh, occupying that chair. But no, not occupying that chair. Occupying a different chair, but but taking the same role. Role, yes. Uh, at this hour, however, Jimmy Aiken, senior apologist here at Catholic Answers and author of A Daily Defense. Uh, let's, uh, Jimmy, let's try to just plow through some questions here because we have quite a few people on the line. Uh, if, if you do want to get on the line, 888-318-7884, the number, and we, if, we don't, if we're not able to get to you this segment, we'll get to you next hour with Tom Nash. We go now to Mitch in Duluth, Minnesota, listening on EWTN. Mitch, your question for Jimmy Aiken. Yeah, hi, Jimmy. Hi, Cy. I've got a practical question for you. I had a uh, family funeral this last weekend, Mm -hmm. um, and my cousin approached me and asked what's going to happen to her husband when he passes. Mm -hmm. Um, So she is a practicing Catholic, and he is non-baptized. He goes with her to Mass, you know, to be a supportive husband and father. Um, But she just doesn't know, you know, can he have a a funeral Mass? Can he be buried in a Catholic cemetery? That kind of thing. So... So practically, what uh, okay. what advice would we be able to give to her? Um, I don't foresee any difficulty uh, in this situation with him. Uh, certainly, not being buried in a, in a in a Catholic cemetery. That's that's something that's done all the time because families like to be buried together, regardless of whether everybody is a member of the church or not. Um, in terms of having a mass for him, you can have a mass said for anybody. Uh, the question is whether it is to be a public funeral mass. And there's, since he's not baptized, there's a little bit of a, of a kind of a hole in canon law regarding his situation. If you look at the relevant canons, which are canon 1183 and 1184 in the Code of Canon Law, and they're on the Vatican website if you want to look them up, um, it, it covers a lot of different categories, uh, including like catechumens, which are people who aren't baptized but are planning to be baptized. It also covers uh, baptized members of other Christian communities. It covers um, a number of different categories, but it doesn't, uh, at least based on a quick reading of it, it doesn't seem to cover people who are not baptized. However, I still don't really foresee any problem because uh, the canons provide that in cases of doubt, the judgment of the local ordinary, the local bishop, uh, is to be consulted, and then his judgment is to be followed. And uh, if you if if you have a situation where, well, my husband wasn't Catholic, but he went to mass all the time to be supportive, and you know it, it's going to help the family if we can just have a normal Catholic funeral for him and everything, I don't foresee a problem with the bishop granting permission in that kind of case. Of course, it'd be even better if he investigates the Catholic faith a little bit. Uh, I mean, he's already going to Mass. Uh, it would be great if he'd investigate the Catholic faith a little bit and maybe join before he died. But uh, even if he doesn't, I don't really foresee a difficulty here unless there's something else affecting the situation. Okay, Mitch? Perfect. Thanks, Jimmy. It's your thing. Thank you, uh, Mitch. Um, I did a good job, too, on that one, Mitch. You thank Jimmy, and I get nothing. Well, no, 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 thank you. No, he, he said thank you, Jimmy. I thank it, you at the end of every I thought I did show a good job on the behalf buttons. of all of the listeners <laughs> oh, for the good true. job you do. Okay, thanks. Come on, Jimmy. I need a little boost, too. Yeah. Chris in Boise, Idaho, listening on Salt and Light. Your question for Jimmy Aiken. Yeah, I'd like to know, uh, I'd like to know, I'd like to proclaim to the world if dogs go to heaven, because I'm pretty sure of that. Hmm. Well, um, so what I can tell you is that the classical analysis of this question would not suggest that dogs go to heaven or that dogs have an afterlife. Um, The classical theological understanding is that every life form has a soul, because the soul is the thing that makes your body alive. And so everything that has a body has a soul, and that would apply to plants, it would apply to one-celled organisms, it would apply to animals, and it would apply to humans. So um, we all have souls. But there's a question of what kind of soul do we have. Um, In the case of plants, the classical theological analysis would say that they have what are known as vegetative souls that enable them to reproduce and grow and metabolize food, but not much more than that. 
Um, in the case of animals, they have what are often called sensitive souls, which not only allow them to grow and reproduce and metabolize, but also to move and feel and have a kind of primitive form of reason. Then humans have what are known as rational souls, which enable us to grow and reproduce and metabolize and feel and think, but also to have the uniquely human gift of reason, which is why we're, we're said to have rational souls. Then there's the question of, well, which of these souls, if any, survive death? Well, it's been divinely revealed to us that human souls survive death, and so um, the standard theological analysis says, well, rational souls will survive death. But the standard analysis has said that's not the case for vegetative souls that plants would have or for sensitive souls that animals would have. Having said that, that's a theological opinion. That's not the teaching of the Church. You won't find that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church or in other contemporary magisterial documents. So even though it's, it's kind of the standard opinion historically, um, it's not a teaching of the Church, and so if you think you have good reason to hold that animals do have afterlives and that dogs in particular uh, could go to heaven, uh, whatever that might mean for a dog, you know, heaven being being united with God and dogs in their natural state don't have the concept of God, but, you know, he could elevate them in the afterlife. He's certainly going to elevate us mm -hmm. in the afterlife. Um, then, uh, then that's an opinion that you could entertain. Uh, I just urge a little bit of caution on that because it does tend to cut against the grain of historical theological analysis on this but it's something that uh, is not prohibited by church teaching. Chris? But in, in the book of Revelation, there's animals in heaven. Well, in the book of Revelation, we have uh, Jesus riding a horse, and that's the only earthly animal that's uh, depicted as being in heaven. But there's a question of, is that a symbol or is that literal, because one of the things about Revelation is it's a highly symbolic book, and so when Jesus is depicted as riding a white horse in Revelation 19, that may just be a symbol of Jesus being victorious, because white horses were a symbol of uh, victorious conquerors, and so now that Jesus has conquered death and sin and the devil, it would be natural to symbolically depict that victory of him as riding a white horse, but it's not clear that there's literally a white horse in heaven and if there were, it wouldn't be clear that this horse had previously died and the, that this was a horse in the afterlife. Now, earlier, earlier in Revelation, I think there is a, there is a, a, a part there where the animals are called into worship in heaven. Maybe the book of Isaiah. Um, well, there are passages now, I, I'm not familiar with what you're thinking of. There are the four living creatures in heaven, in, in the book of Revelation, but the, they're angelic beings that are a fusion of elements taken from Isaiah's seraphim and Ezekiel's cherubim. So they're called the four living creatures, but they're not actually terrestrial animals. They're angelic in nature. There are passages in, uh, in like the Psalms that call upon the animals to praise God with us, but the same passages also call on the plants yeah. and the mountains to do that, and they're not even alive. So those would seem to be poetic, symbolic passages rather than literal statements of what these beings are capable of in this life. Thanks, Chris. More Open Forum coming up. Second hour, uh, uh, Tom Nash will be here with us. And I saw a Twilight Zone where a guy took his dog with him to heaven. Uh -huh, so really? Do you, you don't consider that good source it's material? It's not scripture, but uh, worthy so, for reflection, many Twilight Zone episodes. Okay, so I'll, I'll just reflect upon that one. Thank you very much, Jimmy Aiken. Thank you, Cy Kellett, on behalf of all of the listeners. <laughs> That's for the what great I needed to hear. A guy sometimes needs to hear. Of course, that. we all do. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, uh, all right, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, Tom Nash will be here. So if you are on the line, stay on the line. If you are not on the line, go ahead and dial 888 318 7884. We'll be right back with more Open Forum on Catholic Answers Live. Music. 